my friend, it's such an honor. Um, you know, I'm such a fan of that project and there's a lot to talk about because there's new stuff. But first of all, for maybe people that don't recognize your face or voice, who the hell are you, man? My name is Chad Price. I sing and play guitar in a band called The Vulture Wake. I sing and play guitar in a band called Drag the River. And I sing in a band called All. And I play guitar and sing for Chad Price. <laughs> <laughs> With the band Chad Price. <laughs> That's right, right. Chad, it's so cool. Uh, Virtual Wake, you uh, released on June a new EP called Kingdom. Um, in Canada, it was released through Thousand Island Records. Um, mm -hmm. I listened to it a lot since the release. I love the records. I mean, why I love so much that records, that EP, is because you didn't stop yourself trying to find a, a line that you're going to follow. You try stuff on the records. It's almost prog punk in a way, like all did many times. Uh, was it something that came naturally during the process of creating uh, the songs, or it's something that you have in mind to do? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, like the way, the way we write uh, most of the stuff, uh, like Brandon, uh, guitar player, like he would send uh, like a bunch of music uh to me like just guitar riffs and shit uh so i you know uh to tell you the truth like the last uh few many years i've been listening to like a lot of metal uh and then i got into like a lot of like prog rock and like it's really into like 70s kind of stuff uh you know like jethro toll and that kind of shit so, and, uh, you know, I really like Coheed and Cambria and stuff. Like, I like uh, a, lot of, a lot of, like, very dramatic, uh, kind of cinematic, you know, sounding things, you know, like epic things. So, uh, I mean, I, I never really set out to write uh, anything like, pro, like, you know, prog punk or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I, you know, like I, my brain is just has gotten to the point, I think, where it, it like needs like more. Like, I can't do three chords. I can't do it. Like, my, I'm too, my, I get too bored. Like, my brain like needs like a lot of intricacies and interactions and stuff. So, uh, you know, like as I was crafting like the songs i mean i wrote like half of them just by myself and then brandon gave me uh music and stuff and uh you know the band got involved there but but uh you know i uh i guess like in the big picture i was trying to kind of craft something a little like kind of it's cool dr very dramatic you know I think I'm at that point when, you know, I'm looking to new music. I'm trying to find something that, you know, make me make me think, OK, those guys did something so original. I need originality. And there's something missing for many years because most of the band, there's a lot of band that started up, trying to recreate what they love. We love Blink. Mm -hmm. We're going to play like Blink. And sure. it's never kind of working. You have to really find your own path. And I think with the Vulture Wake, you distance yourself from every project you do, and it's very different. And I'm sure that, you know, you don't take a project to do the same. It's always to do something different mm -hmm. and yourself uh, as a musician, but also uh, with the other member. Yeah, for sure. Um... <laughs> was, was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll see it's more a chit chat than direct question but yeah I that, you know musically people are, are way more open mind you know with the spotify band camp if there's a positive side i think people uh are not afraid to say that they listen to everything which sure. back in the days 
you are a metalhead, you are a metalhead, you don't listen to punk and you are a punk rocker and you don't go with the metal shit and everything. But now right. everything has changed. I think it's cool that you arrived with that EP at that time after the pandemic. Was the pandemic mm -hmm. else, uh, you fast, fastening like the thing to get it out more uh, quick? Uh, because we obviously we had two years of nothing to do. Yeah, well, uh, like I, like back before the pandemic, like uh, uh, me, me and Brandon like had to uh, get rid of uh, Joe and Sean, our drummer and bass player, because they were in big punk rock bands and they couldn't, they could never go on tour with us, you know, because either lag wagon or or. Uh, so like a good riddance for on tour, you know. So we're like, all right, I'm sorry, guys, but we're gonna we need some we need some dudes who could tour. <laughs> so you know, we got rid of we got rid of our friends Joe and Sean, which was tough anyway. Uh, but then we got uh, some old friends of mine, John and Dave, who who joined. Uh, you know, and then we played about ten shows, uh, and then the world shut down. You know, <laughs> so. So then it was like, fuck, um, you know, obviously at the be at the beginning of this pandemic, we had no idea how long it was going to last, you know, but once it was clear that, uh, we were probably going to be sitting tight for quite a while, <laughs> you know, it was like, that, that's like, that's when, you know, I mean, that both of these EPs that are being released, I mean, everything was written during that time. You know, it was just like constant news cycles, uh, shit changing every day. Uh, you know, the fucking president we had down here. Uh, you know, I mean, there was just so much insane shit going on. And it was like, I mean, in a way, like, we kind of lucked out for this record because, you know, it was just a treasure trove. <laughs> of info and inspiration for it and the world was shut down so we weren't even going anywhere you know it was like you're you're pretty much just forced to sit here and write a fucking record you know what i mean so it was like i mean and then you know and then once uh you know the world started loosening up a little bit i mean obviously we were like we need to get this shit out asap <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, knowing full well every other band in the world is going to do that exact same thing, and every other band in the world is going to try to go on tour immediately. You know, it's like it just kind of it's you know it's still kind of a shit show that uh, hasn't worked itself out yet. Obviously, people are still canceling stuff. You know, <laughs> but uh, so I was like, I mean, obviously we we needed to get it out as fast as possible because I mean the songs are you know, relevant to, you know, the political landscape of the world. Uh, they were, they're also very relevant to this former president I'm speaking of. Uh, you know, so it's like the, the shit needs to come out, like now. Like it's, you know, these are stories about <laughs> the times we're going through, you know. It's true. And there's so much to complain about, you know, we're regressing as a society and mm -hmm. the state with, um, you know, what happened. Uh, and there's so much thing, you know, like the racism during the pandemic, get out again, like, like it's a nonstop circle that seems to have no hand. And it's weird because I think that our generation and your generation, we're kind of stuck in the middle where our parents didn't really give a fuck about all those things because it was not of their time, and I cannot blame them. And right. we start to understand that it was wrong, the nature, the racism, uh, how we treat people around us, gender. And then you got our kids that are into that, and they're yeah. so scared of this situation, and they want to change it. So it's a clash of generation where the old parts are politicians and the government and they try to put that mark you know in my time it was that so it's gonna be like that now and it's gonna end it's it's just a matter of time but it's it's really pissed me off too that we're really regressing as a society and in canada it's the same 
I mean, yeah. our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is a, is a hey hole too. <laughs> and we're, we're down, we're down, you know, we're just regressing too. So it's, you're right, it was the perfect timing because the words are there and we need that. Right. Yeah, it's strange because, uh, you know, I mean, you know, like in theory, shit is going to change and these old ways are going to die out. I mean, these old folks are going to die eventually. Uh, <laughs> but, fuck, I mean, I don't know, what is it? it? Like You know, I mean, it's just a handful of fucking billionaires that are feeding, you know, that it's been going on forever, you know, like, and, uh, they're not gonna die out, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> you know, just just when you yeah. think you're gaining some traction, you know, it's like fuck. You know, now we got Fox News telling us this, and you know, seventy percent of the fucking country believes it now, or whatever. It's ridiculous. Fuck. <laughs> you no, know, it's gonna be crazy because you're gonna be back in Quebec and like. The people are getting so crazy at shows because of all that, you know. We 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 were living 400 miles an hour before the pandemic, and then we had the time of our life in front of us during two years. So I think a lot of people that didn't want really to understand or didn't give a shit about that with what you say, like Fox News in the States here, it's TVA, which is like shit there. It's just, just about fear and, and getting you think that it's it's the end of the year, you know, every news. And it, 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 it that create a climate where now people just want to go off. They just want to have fun and be happy and just, you know, be with each other. So it's cool to see that we, we understood a lot of things that, you know, we took for granted and we can lose any time, like music. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing we can't, we desperately need to hold on to. <laughs> it's the, it's one of the I mean, it's one of the most important things in the world to all of us. Uh I mean, you know, me is that's fucking what I do, you know. So it's like we need it. It's important. It's good for our fucking mental health, you know. And, and, you know, it's art in general. I realized during the two years, I miss going to museum and just checking painting and just like, just, you know, live something through uh, the vision of other artists and have a different feeling about that. And it's just that, you know, it's the culture thing, the importance, uh, you know, mentally, because like you guys should have the salary of a therapist because that's what you are. <laughs> Good. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I agree. I'll take 80 bucks an hour. <laughs> Be my personal therapist. But, you know, after a show, you feel so well. And I'm sure it's the same every time you play, like, the amount of energy that the, the crowd gave you and just the brain just feel great for the next two days after, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can't wait to get back up there uh, into Canada. That uh, is this music for cancer at the same location as it was the last time we were there. Yes. Uh, you, did you play inside? Because there was a couple of years the venue was inside, outside. Yeah, it's the same place. That's right. That that small town. Yes. Yeah. It's cool. it's it's, great, it's not great. really big. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. That that place was so beautiful. That, that was such a good time. It's a, it's a cool festival and you know, it it's uh most of people would think that a festival like that would happen in Montreal, but it's cool to see like those little towns and I'm sure you guys will not aware of will never go outside like playing a gig like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do you remember, Chad, the first time you came in Quebec, um, not with a vulture wake, but uh, maybe with all or another project? Mm, I don't. I mean, I'm, it was obviously all, you know, and it was it was probably right when I joined the band, you know, so it was uh, 30 years ago. Yeah, you know? and we keep going. There was so much down that I'm sure you lost count at the point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I mean, when I was young and shit, you know, when I first started touring, 
uh, I mean, I was just so excited. Uh, everything, it was just a whirlwind, you know? So like, I don't even know. Like for a couple of years, I was just fucking just floating along. I had no fucking idea what I was doing. <laughs> and it was just a blast. It's crazy. And, and you know, before you join out, were you involved in other band or were you writing songs? I'll, I'll, and how that offer came to you? Um, I, I was in a band. Uh, I mean, I had been in a few bands. Um, nothing serious, you know. I mean, you know, kind of out of high school. And then, you know, when I was 19, 20, um, uh, I had this band called Apple Tree. Um, We were just, you know, kind of a rock and roll band, uh, a la Replacements or Soul Asylum, that kind okay. of thing. Not near as good, obviously. But uh, <laughs> at, at, at some point, uh, I, I met Bill. Uh, we kind of became friends. Those guys actually moved out and uh, lived like two hours away from me. Okay. Uh, And, and then, uh, like, Bill knew I was in a band and shit. Uh, so whenever Scott quit, he just he just called and asked if I wanted to try out. And uh, I was the first one to try out. Uh, and then he flew out to L.A. for, like, a week. And uh, came back and told me I got it if I wanted. <laughs> and then shows, album, shows, 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 album. Uh, yeah. Bro, they did. It's crazy like think about it that you know like you said you were involved in, in music but not in big touring and everything and get in all even if for a, a lot of people uh there was not as big maybe at the descendants but still they have such an impact and for every musician that i know every pop musicians uh love all because it's uh it's a musically Uh, and really interesting band because like you do with a vulture wake they really try a lot of things and, and bring riff that people like what the hell i will never put that in the songs but that's worse because it's all <laughs> right right yeah totally <laughs> yeah but um oh shit oh sorry Um, I feel like the couch tried to eat Chad. <laughs> it did. I had a pillow behind me that's doing something. Couldn't figure out what's going on. Okay, where are we at? Yeah, so when you joined, oh, you went on tour like crazy. And was it something that got you really exhausted fast? Because, you know, without the experience, it's really hard to find the balance at first about resting, not partying. Just keep your vocal and. Uh, when I initially joined, uh, like, you know, obviously I'm not, I wasn't a professional. I had never sang like night after night after night, you know, until I joined the band. And, uh, you know, I mean, we started practicing like every day. So, you know, you build up that kind of stamina. But uh, since I'd never really done it, live like that I kind of actually I mean I should have and I did I, I took it very seriously <laughs> but um, but me like you know like not I had never been trained or anything for singing uh, I always had uh, you know I mean those songs are just a lot of it was is just written at the very top of my range you know so you're basically just yelling as hard as you can the whole set so uh like even even though like when i joined the band and stuff like i quit smoking uh i wasn't drinking very much you know i'm like i gotta get my shit together uh i still you know had problems still had problems so then you know after a couple of years I was like, well, maybe I'll start smoking again. <laughs> start drinking heavily. Uh, you know, so, and then it was, you know, we had a couple more years left in us, and that's pretty much when we stopped, we stopped touring. 
however long ago that was, 20 years ago. Shit, I don't even know anymore. And and then I, I think at that time, around that, that time, you for uh, Drag the River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, when was that? Yeah, I mean, I joined, I joined all in about 93. Um, uh, toured around for a while, uh, like a year in, into me joining, we moved to Colorado, uh, to Fort Collins, Colorado out there. And that's when I met, uh, Snodgrass, uh, from Drag the River. So it was about 95, me and him actually started playing, uh, you know, a couple of years later, we act, we had a band, uh, but yeah, I mean, we'd been playing since fucking 95, long time. Yeah, and I know John well. I did many interviews with them and talk about Drag the River. And that's another thing. That that project is so different from all. I'm sure people were maybe surprised, some positively, maybe some negative, because it was different. But when you look at it, you guys were kind of pioneers, because that's how now a lot of bands try to recreate it. Sure. And you arrived something so different so original and i really love the vibe of the band and the evolution is is really cool too because uh you and john you know uh, as you said really grow up as musician and you know it's just we see the talent uh through every fucking records and it's uh, i love that band cool thank you yeah it was crazy when we first started uh I don't re I don't even remember if we put anything out before we actually started traveling around but uh uh right when we started touring around like the people who would come to the shows were all fans. <laughs> and this is like you know like nobody really knew they just knew it was Chad from all you know and John from Armchair Marsha and you know I mean you probably be it would be safe to uh to think it was going to be some kind of rock and roll i guess and uh you know so it, it was uh it was pretty strange there for a while like you, you would have these punkers and shit just show up and it'd just be me and john with acoustic guitars and they're like what the fuck <laughs> uh some of them liked it and would continue to come back some bailed and we and we never saw again until all played but uh yeah, but but you know, th then we got better. Uh, we actually kind of turned into a real band, and uh, at some point, we got fans uh, of our own that don't know who all or Armchair Martian is. So when we got to that point, then it was very exciting. It's like, all right, we've actually done something. <laughs> We're not just fucking riding coattails of other bands, you know. So it was good. <laughs> Yeah, and like it's cool because like the fans are amazing. I mean, there's a like there's so much style involved in that band that it brings a lot of people from different style of music, like country guy, rockers, punk rockers, and melod. And it's cool to see that it's uh, they find something uh, through Drag the River that they fucking dig, you know. Because I like I said, I think that as a musician, if you try to create just one thing, you just copy it. And you know, I don't. But if you know music and you put like fifty them that you love in the songs, <laughs> it's just like it just proves that you know your your music, you know. And it's just the influence, and it gets you with your mentality and and your talent. It it do something different. Right, all right. Yeah, I mean, everything you consume throughout your life uh, becomes a part of you, you know? So it's like, uh, uh, I always thought it was crazy that that people would want to, like, emulate a band or, or whatever, you know, like, just so perfectly. It's like, I mean, you have all this shit in your brain, all of it, just coming in here, you know, from everywhere at all times. And you just want to do this simple thing like that you're barely even putting effort into because you're just copying something else. You know, it's like, I don't know, you know, it's like, it, you know, a, a lot of things like that. It's, uh, there are like performers and there are musicians, you know what I mean? And that, I think that separates a lot of bands, you know? Uh, some people just want to be 
uh, the center of attention, you know, so whatever I can do to get there, uh, if that's, you know, playing these three chords and, and you know, just sounding like <laughs> Blink-182, that's what I'm going to do to get there, you know, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, it's like, do what you want to fucking do. But I mean that that is the separation, you know. And then you have yeah. like you have like Bill Stevenson and Stephen Edgerton and Carl Alvarez who are musicians, <laughs> you know. And uh, other people are too. <laughs> I'm just you know, just throwing that out there as a reference, but. And and people have you know I think a lot understand that if if you want to achieve what those guys did like Bill Steven and and Milo and you need a discipline that is insane you really have to love it because every time i, I i've got friends that got uh, recorded at the blasting uh, studio they always said bill is always there and i arrive at 7 a.m so when he arrive i don't know and we leave at 5 6 p.m because we won't you know be here the most of our time and he's still there and it's crazy that that dedication to music, it's pretty rare and it's not an easy thing to do. So a lot of band got discouraged, I think, through the process. And some are just like crazy, like Bill and just right. go for it, go for all. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's easy to get discouraged, you know, trying to, you know, like when your favorite guitar player is... Uh, you know, fuck it, whoever, I don't know, Yngwie, Baumstein, or whatever. You know, it's like, God damn, no matter what I do, I can't play like Yngwie. It's like, no shit, you know? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yes, it's easy to get discouraged, but, you know, you gotta, you know, he started somewhere, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, you could get into music, uh and if, for that purpose like i just want to be this brilliant musician and you might reach a point where you're like i think this is about as far as i'm gonna go <laughs> yeah so i'll just stick with this and then, but you know you could keep trying but whatever yeah <laughs> whatever <laughs> and, but yeah but speaking of like bill and shit it's like you know i mean he practices all the fucking time like when I joined all, <clears throat> uh, you know, walk into the practice room and there's a fucking set list that's pretty much every all or descendant song, right? Like everyone. Fucking set list from like the ceiling to the floor. So like every day we would go in uh, usually like twice uh, for a couple hours at a time. Uh, go in, you know... Play, play, play until somebody can't play anymore. Then, like, we go eat, shit, come back in a couple of hours and start there and go through, play, play, play until somebody can't play anymore. And it's like we did that like six, you know, six days a week. And uh, not everybody has that. I didn't, I didn't have it, you know, like, but, but I'm glad I was put in that situation because now I do have it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's fun that you mentioned that. I think it was the same for Scott. That's what he told me. And when I spoke to Dave too, like that discipline and um, if you want to reach that, that goal and higher level, it's uh, that's what you have to do. And it's a pain in the ass and it creates conflict sometimes and you get exhausted. But at the end, like you mentioned, I think that the way that you're proud of that and after all those years, it's still uh, accurate and decent because of that, you know, because there are so many records that are so good. The songs are amazing, but it's so bad, you know, re record like the Misfit is a fucking good example. I mean, the era of Glenn Denzig sure. was really bad recording, but the songs are all jam. So it would be crazy mm -hmm. that those guys had the chance to do what uh, the Dissidents did with the first records. And then, you know, it was so well sounding for that times. And they didn't right. have much money. It was really the discipline, like you said. Like, okay, we don't have, we cannot hire another drummer. So, Bill, you will have to hit that snares like a million times. Let's do that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. D just do it yourself. You know, you don't have the money. Whatever. 
I'll do it. I'll figure out how to do it. You know, that's, that's like that's how those guys like record it. That's how they started recording, and that's why they're like as good at recording now as they are. You know, it's like I'm gonna fucking learn how to do it. You know, I don't want to pay somebody else to do it. It's like I, you know, like I'm not that kind of person. I can't just like I'm not gonna dive <laughs> into books and shit. And you know, I don't have it in me. But very specific, but you specific when- things. And that's cool. So do you think, like, I'm sure you're in the same, you don't know like me, but would there be any possibility that I will play again uh, uh, for a festival or a show like you did at the Rock Fest? Uh, probably. Um, <laughs> like, as, as far as any touring or anything, I would say probably not. Uh, but who knows? Uh, As far as festivals, uh, you know, like Bill asked me every now and then, like, you know, like we the, we did punk rock bowling. Uh, we did the uh, that rock, uh, Montebello Rock Fest or whatever up in Canada a few years ago. Uh, you know, so we do like some festival shit every now and then. And uh, I'm always open to doing it. Like, I mean, you know, I love that band, always have. Uh, you know, they were my favorite band before I joined the band. Uh, And I uh, still love the songs. I still love playing on stage with them. And like when I do that kind of stuff, I actually get to play if, to, to a lot of people, you know, <laughs> which sadly a Vulture Wake does not get to do yet. <laughs> It's going to happen at Music for Cancer because everybody's going to be there. You hear that, Quebec? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's gonna be it's gonna be so much fun. I cannot I cannot wait. And it's gonna be cool because like I, I said, I love the project and since uh, Thousand Island is involved with uh Canada part, uh it brings a lot of people. So a lot of people discover you guys with the first records and now with the time on their end, uh with the pandemic and everything, they're discovering you with uh the new EP and also the new single, because the EP was released in June, and I think you just released another song that was not on on the ep if i'm right <laughs> you are correct um we have ep number two it's called animal uh it's coming out uh september 9th september 9th wow uh we're, we're gonna release another single uh middle august like august 15th or 16th Uh, yeah, and then uh, the second EP uh, comes out September 9th. It's a good idea because, like, you could have released one record, <clears throat> but the problem now is things are so fast. So when you release the record in January, a lot of people would ask you in September, so what, you guys, uh, is there a new record coming? We just released one eight months ago. Shit, it's a long, long time, so it's weird. So releasing two EP. It keep you on the um, the news fed of like those social media because I call it the monster. You always yeah. have to feed the monster, and when you don't feed him for weeks, you're not existing anymore in social media. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that way you get to extend uh, being in people's faces. You know, like you you always have something to promote. You know what I mean? Um, and then. Uh, Eventually, I think the, the these two EPs, uh, which are just di- which are digital, uh, are going to be side A and side B of a uh, vinyl of a full length. Whenever we get that, whenever that part, whenever that comes, I mean, it's already at the 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 record plant, you know. <laughs> But who knows how long it's going to take? Yeah. I think it's because of Adele, like everybody got delay with, uh, cause Sonny buff off of all of the, you know, pressing shop. And now that there's so much delay, but it's cool that you do it because there's a lot of collector out there and it's, they really help ban those people. Uh, a lot of see them as crazy, but man, without them, it, it, it would be kind of impossible because it costs a lot to press vinyl. You don't get a lot of money through that. And yeah. so, like, if 
people buy every color, it, it it's the game changer, I think. So people, you have to grab that. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's like I, you know, like I want I want people to have like a physical copy of it, you know. Like I mean, it's great that you could just you know get on your phone and listen to any record you want to. Like I love it. Uh, <laughs> obviously, but nobody's making money off that. And uh, it's not even about the money, you know? Uh, like, I I want somebody to have a physical copy of something, and I'm not going to do a cassette. I, I am not backing these people who are trying to bring back cassettes. Fuck cassettes. They're pieces of shit. And, uh, you know, and like, <laughs> and like now, CDs are just like, uh, you know, like I, I still have like boxes of like Drag the River CDs and stuff. You know, it's like the, just you, you can't, I, you can barely get get rid of them now. You know, so it's it's like, well, really, the only cool thing is at least vinyl is big, and uh, you know, it's like art, a piece of art. You know, you could destroy it. Uh, it's, it's, so it's like you feel like you're getting something. Not to mention that it sounds beautiful. You know. I mean, they all sound good. You know, CD obviously sounds great. But, uh, you know, we know there's something about vinyl that, that you can't really recreate, you know. It's true. And I think my, my five bucks theory about why vinyl came back to life, it's because I think people now, um, since they have like Spotify and everything, they, they want to encourage bands. So they want the collector thing. So they got that. ID inside their head that one day there's going to be value around that because they see like those Pink Floyd first press selling like 5,000 bucks uh, on eBay. So they think like, I'm going to get that jam. So it's cool. And, and yeah. you know, a lot of people understood that, yeah, the sounding, it's the best way to listening music. And my kid, when I put vinyl, they're like, I, I want to like the needle, they want to put the needle and they love it. And there's a feeling about that. There's something that you cannot have with uh, the digital. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, not to mention just the, uh, like the nostalgia of being a fucking 12 year old kid, you know, like listening to Van Halen records in the basement and shit, you know, I mean, it, it, it gives me a feeling that, uh, you know, nothing else gives me. You know, and for something to for something to be to have that powerful of an effect on you, you know, it's like it, it it's great. It's it's killer. Yeah, I it's mean, funny it's also, that you... oh yeah, it's, all, it's also the most inconvenient way to listen to music. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Van Halen. That was the first show I saw in my life. Um, when I was something like 12. <laughs> That's funny because uh, my first, I mean, like, I I think I'd, I'd, I saw, like, do you know who the babies are? No. Okay. Uh, like, Jonathan Cain, he was, he was the keyboard player for Journey. Like, he wrote okay. all those, he wrote all those huge songs, you know, uh, you know, Don't Stop Believing and all that shit. Uh, but he was in. <laughs> he was in this band called the Babies, and uh, the singer John Waite. If you remember him, I don't know, but uh, he was a singer. So, my actually my first concert ever was the Babies, uh, oh. and it was it was at a like an amusement uh, an amusement park in Missouri, and I was I was probably like ten, uh, but. My actual first concert was when I was 12. It was Van Halen on the 1984 tour. Lucky dude. I, I saw it, yeah. it was huge that, arena. Must be crazy because it was like the second records they released in 94. Wait, say that again. I think it was the second the second records of Van Halen at that time in 94. 84? I, I, I saw them with Sammy Ager and it was the Balance Tour. So it was 90, 95. 
and it was good, but I never saw like um, David Lee Roth. I only saw Sammy Yeager, and I, I so it's it's not before like um, you know Eddie died. Uh, it was not that tie alive, so I didn't miss uh, the reunion. Was not that good, I think. But yeah, man, that, it must have been crazy in those days. I mean, I was twelve <laughs> when I saw it. Uh, so who, like, who knows? Uh, I mean, like, David Lee Roth was like my all-time favorite front man, not singer. I mean, I know he can't sing, but. <laughs> as far as a showman, I mean, you know, that no, but there's nobody really better than him. So I like grew up with Van Halen, uh, David Lee Roth in particular, you know. So uh, it was like that. Although I don't really remember what it sounded like back then, it's built up quite a bit in my head. <laughs> it's just as like my first memory, you know what I mean. It's cool, me too. Like, it's the same thing. And it's funny because, like, you're the second person in the punk scene I spoke about Van Halen. Uh, the other one was LFA, which is a huge fan of Van Halen. So we spoke about hours about those era and, and he uh, catched them too back in the day. So it's cool, man. It was a machine. Like, seeing Eddie Van Halen playing live, it was crazy. And their bassist was so good. And the drum solo... And they all, all did their solo, and it was it was a huge machine. And yeah, I still got my shirt of the tour. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. From like '95. Yeah, yeah. I keep everything. Really, like every shirt, every uh, tickets. I've I've got them all. <laughs> nice, good, good. So, Chad, we're gonna see each other in September. Um, people, I repeat myself, go grab the EP. Uh, of course, if you want to buy the vinyl, just wait for it. And man, can't wait. Um, I'm sure it, since it's going to be released, you're going to play the both EP uh, on this tour and some song from the first one. Uh, yeah, we've been, we've been playing like pretty much like all our new songs. A uh, couple songs off the off our first record, but. Uh, we've been playing like mainly new stuff. Yep. Chad, thank you so much. You've always been generous with me and I appreciate. Uh, I must admit it, I'm a huge, huge, huge all fans since so many years. And having you, uh, it's crazy. And I, I'm never tell, I never tell you that the last time. But last time I've got Dave. And then a month later, I've got Scott on interview for the first time. And then you. And I did, I did all. I free singer of all. It was nice. my quest was done. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, love it. Nice. Well, thank and you, then, man. Thank, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have the time of your life till we see each other's. And again, thank you. And make sure I send Mike all the details. Uh, I'm gonna hear the interview around the release of the next single, so we can play both singles. And we're going to do a huge special playing like uh, the EP in his entire and some old school songs from the first records. Killer. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Chad, before we leave, we're going to celebrate our uh, 14 years anniversary as a radio show. Can you do me a quick ID, but just keep it simple. Like, I, this is Chad and you're listening and happy 14 years. And the show is called Prescription Punk Rock, but go as simple as you want. Prescription Punk Rock, 14 years. Yes. Hey, folks, this is Chad Price. Oh, Vulture Week. You've been listening to Prescription. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, worry, I'm doing montage. <laughs> I'll make it a little simpler. <laughs> Hey folks, this is Chad Price. You've been listening to Prescription Punk Rock for 14 years. Hell yeah. Thank you. Two, two <laughs> takes. How professional you are. <laughs> not bad, not bad. So Chad, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you took time. You've always been generous. I repeat myself, but can't wait to see you. Have fun. 
uh, with the new songs. And congratulations, there's something to be proud of. And say hi to everyone in the band. I will. I appreciate it. You have a good one, man. I will see you soon. Hell yeah. Thank you, brothers. Cheers.